Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Baker Institute. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, it's great to have you all here. Uh, I'm uh, Jim Crane, and uh, I work for the Center for Energy Studies here. I do uh, look into uh, energy geopolitics and I specialize in the Middle East. So, uh, in my role, uh, I've had the, uh, the, 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 the great pleasure of hanging out with our speaker tonight, uh, uh, Mike Hankey, the Consul General in Dahran in the Saudi Arabia's eastern province, the, the oil producing area of Saudi Arabia. Uh, I've actually hung out with him over there in, on two occasions during his tenure, uh, most recently in February. Uh, and I can attest to just what an effective diplomat Mike Hankey really is. Uh, on my last visit, uh, on my way to, uh, to the consulate uh, to, to, to join uh, uh, Mike and uh, some of his uh, colleagues on a, a visit off-site. I uh, actually got into a small car accident on the, on the way to the consulate, uh, as you do in, in Saudi Arabia. And uh, uh, you know, my, my driver was actually had, was speeding, uh, but in reverse. Uh, and lo and behold, we, uh, we got into a small wreck. Uh, uh, but a big argument ensued. Uh, as, as happens, uh, you know, when you're speeding in reverse and you crash into someone. Uh, and so I got my luggage and left the car, and uh, there was a TGI Fridays uh, just, uh, you know, on, at, uh, just off the, you know, off the curb there, and I called uh, 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 one of Mike's uh, colleagues, and uh, the, the consul general was uh, gracious enough to steer his his uh, motorcade, I guess his two vehicle uh, uh, convoy to come and pick me up at the TGI Fridays instead of uh, 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 finding, you know, uh, uh, making me find an alternate transportation. So I'm still very grateful to you for that, Mike. <laughs> okay. Uh, so although Saudi drivers may not always be watching the roads, uh, there's plenty of us who are watching the movements of the kingdom uh, as a nation state in public policy, uh, in economics, and as an international actor. Uh, Saudi Arabia is the kind of place where uh, domestic policy has uh, repercussions all over the globe, uh, and, of, and of course, uh, uh, and, you know, right here in Houston especially. Um, so naturally, we're happy to have Mike Hankey with us today to give us a peek uh, behind the curtain. It's not always a, a place that's uh, uh, easy to get reliable information on. Uh, but uh, as you all know, uh, Saudi Arabia got a new king uh, in 2015, so King Salman looks to be the, lo the last in the long line of sons of the founder, uh, King Abdulaziz ibn Saud, uh, who the, the founder of the Saudi state. Uh, and after Salman, the, the handover will, will ensue to the, the third generation uh, of, of Al Saud. Now, two members of that uh, generation are already in place, uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Nayef uh, and Deputy Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. So the third generation of Al Saud is going to have the tricky task of steering uh, the kingdom uh, to a future that's less dependent on, you know, exports of simple exports of crude oil uh, as a way to, to fund the, the, the economy, the government budget, and provide jobs. Uh, they are looking to uh, to go uh, well beyond that in this, uh, you know, kingdom that's growing in size, in, in population, uh, and in sophistication. Uh, and so, uh, some of the thinking about how Saudi's going to do this have been uh, just released uh, recently. So the uh, um, Saudi Vision 2030 and the National Transformation Program uh, have just been uh, uh, unveiled, and uh, that is uh, uh, Mike Hankey's topic for tonight. Uh, so Mike Hankey has served as U.S. Consul General in Dahran since July of 2014. Uh, He's a career member of the Senior Foreign Service. Uh, he's previously Senior Advisor for the Bureau of International Information Programs in Washington. Since joining the Foreign Service in 2001, Hanke has led teams building ties with political and economic and media partners across the Middle East, Africa, and South Asia. He spent time in Egypt both before and during the Arab Spring, where he advanced engagement with Muslim and Christian communities. During earlier tours, he promoted economic development in northwestern Iraq, uh, American consular and commercial interests in Yemen, uh, and media professionalism in Nigeria. Prior to the, form, the Foreign Service, he worked as a newspaper reporter and an editor for a news service covering the UN. 
Hankey received his bachelor's from George Washington University and a master's from Indiana University. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Council General Mike Hankey. Yeah. Thanks very much, Jim. All right. Good luck. Thank you. Jim, thank you very much. Ambassador Dirigian and everyone from the Baker Institute, thank you for this great opportunity here today. I, uh, I appreciate that I get to come back to the Baker Institute. I was just rec remembering that I was here three years ago on a wonderful set of seminars that the Baker Institute set up for U.S. diplomats heading out to uh, countries with large oil and gas industries, Saudi Arabia among them. We learned a lot from it, and I really feel like this is a nice way that I can repay how you guys have helped us out. Um, I, uh, I'm especially happy to, to be here today. Jim, Jim was nice to go through my bio. Um, I, uh, I've put quite a few things together into my career that I was telling some of the guests here today. Uh, I know I look young to some people. Today's my birthday and I just turned 16. So if you could be very nice to me. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Be, be nice to me and keep, uh, keep the question simple. But before we get into to questions for me, I, I do have some things and uh, I think my microphone is working so I can walk a bit. I want to ask, uh, I want to ask the crowd some questions so I know what we have. Can you just raise your hand if you've been to Saudi Arabia? That is awesome. I don't know what I need to tell you guys. Who's been to Dahran in the eastern province? Very good. Well then, let me ask you guys some questions with some data that will help me uh, explain to the rest of the crowd kind of where we're going. The topic of the speech is opportunities for U.S. businesses in Saudi Arabia. So I work at the U.S. Consulate General. Who knows when the U.S. Consulate was founded in the Eastern Province? You get even within the decade right and you win an American Saudi flag pin. Where are we, where are we go? We got one in the back there. Not quite, not quite. 1930s. Nope. 1940s, right here. I heard it first. There it is. 1944. The first U.S. consulate uh, building was founded in 1944. Where was it founded? Who can tell me where it was founded? Jeddah. In Jeddah? No, the first consulate in the eastern province. The, the first consulate for the whole country was in Jeddah, and that was in the 19th century, in the 1800s. You're absolutely right about that. But the consulate in Dahran, where was that founded? Hobar. Who, who knows? Nope, not in Khobar. Not in Dhamam. Not in Jubail. Did I hear somebody say Aramco? Aramco camp, oh, get her a pin, here we go. Here, Jim, pass the pin to the lady in the back, please. Very good, very good. Are you a former Aramco employee by any chance, or a connected, what's that? Current, Current. well done. So if you, if you happen to go to Aramco, you can go to house number 1635A on the Aramco camp. It looks like a slice of South Texas transplanted into, uh, into Eastern Saudi Arabia. Our first building was there in 1944 uh, on the Aramco camp and we moved off shortly thereafter to some land that King Abdulaziz granted to the US government and some buildings that we built in the late 1940s with uh, labor that was assisted by former Italian prisoners of war, taken prisoner by the Brits in World War II in Eritrea. And then after the war, they had more work to do in Eastern Saudi, building buildings for us, an air base, and for Aramco than they did going home to Sicily. So last question, one more pin to go. Who can tell me, name another country that has a consulate in the Eastern province of Saudi Arabia? No. Nope. 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 It's a trick question. There are no other countries with consulates in the Eastern Province. There are two British uh, fellow diplomats. So who said UK first? There you go. You get the pin. There you go. So did you say it first? I'll get another pin for you. So. There are two British diplomats who are based in Riyadh and they work out of their house and they do some commercial promotion. But the U.S. consulate 
is the only consulate in the Eastern Province. So it's an area the size of France. It's got about four million people, mostly concentrated in the Tri-City area. If you've heard of Damam, Khobar, or Dahran, you're thinking of three neighborhoods within the real one metropolitan area. That, uh, that presence that we have there has been continuous since 1944, and it really represents the, the historical time span of some important uh, parts of the economy of Saudi Arabia that I'm going to talk about, both in terms of what we were doing. We were there initially to support the oil and gas workers. At that time, Aramco was completely American-owned, and it was largely staffed at the engineering level and the oil and gas expertise level by Americans. Aramco has changed. In 1980, it was, uh, it was very cordially bought out by the Saudi government. The staff has changed over time. Yet even today, there are about 3,000 American employees at Aramco, a company that employs about 60,000 people directly on its books. And a lot of what we do is support those employees and the rest of the 20,000 Americans in the Eastern Province. And we try to build the very best industrial partnerships between the industrial base of Saudi Arabia and partners on the US side. There is a lot of oil and gas in that. But in addition, we also work on protecting those facilities. We work on training people to work in those facilities. And we work on the travel that's necessary to keep them going. So, Today, what I'm talking about is US opportunities. And opportunity comes from change and from challenges. So to set, the, to set the scene, first of all, let's make sure that we know what are some of those challenges. I think there's three major challenges that Saudi Arabia is facing and that Vision 2030, which I will get to talking about, is meant to address. So you have a demographic challenge. You got roughly 30, 33 million people in Saudi Arabia. Maybe 8 to 10 million of those are foreigners. Uh, obviously not mostly Americans. We've got about 60,000 Americans in the whole country a lot from South Asia and Southeast Asia. You've got roughly half of the population under the age of 25. Youth employment under the age of 25 is roughly 30%. Uh, unemployment across the entire economy is less in the single digits, but uh, it, it's hard to measure and it's hard to know how many people exactly aren't necessarily looking for work. You also have uh, a recognition that the level of training and preparation of this young workforce to go into highly skilled technical jobs is not necessarily there. So that's your demographic challenge. You've got a competitive challenge where you're looking at roughly 70% of Saudis being employed by the Saudi government. So they aren't necessarily in the private sector. Uh, they aren't necessarily in a sector that's increasing the GDP of the country. Uh, you also have a competitive challenge that starts going into looking at the oil and gas industry, especially when you look at crude oil that's being burnt to create electricity. Maybe it's electricity to uh, fuel desalinization plants or to fuel um, power to go towards air conditioning. So you've got this competitive pressure. You, you've got demographics, you've got competition. And then I think on the economic side, one of the really biggest ones I want to quote some figures on to make sure I get them right is a pressure to diversify the economy. 90% plus of the entire uh, revenue for the Saudi government comes from the oil and gas sector. 85 or 80% plus of export earnings for the country comes from the oil and gas sector. And fully 45% of total GDP comes from the oil and gas sector. So if you're here in Houston and you follow oil and gas industry and everything connected to it, you know well that the cyclical nature of any commodity, but especially oil and gas, means you've got booms and busts. And that's not the best way to ensure that your citizenry can have good, steady jobs, things that they can be focused on and find as meaningful employment. So those three pressures set the scene. The pressures were well known long before we got into talking about current King Salman. The King Abdullah, who passed away in early 2015, 
He recognized these pressures and he started several things. They were uh, perhaps best uh, seen as a series of specific initiatives. You had the King Abdullah University for Science and Technology set up and run by Aramco, but striving out in its West Coast location near Jeddah to hit a very high standard for research uh, with world-class professors, uh, people coming in, male and female, both from around the world. That was a specific initiative that he launched. Another one that he launched was getting the right for women to vote and for women to run for uh, participation in municipal councils. Now municipal councils don't necessarily have uh, power akin to a uh, city council here in the US, but they are a representative body. And in December of 2015, you had the first, uh, the first mixed gender, multi-gender uh, election where women could run and vote. That was something he'd started. He'd earlier started as well women's participation in the Shura Council. This is the consultative council that advises the king and the cabinet on new laws. The, um, uh, the, the King Abdullah Scholarship Program, it was known as CASP, and it's since changed its name to be the Custodian of the Two Holy Mosques Scholarship Program was started under King Abdullah about 10 years ago in recognition that the kingdom needs to invest in its young people and send them abroad, especially for high level research and preparation for white collar jobs. Because of that program, you have 90,000 students from Saudi Arabia and more studying in any given year here in the United States. I'm sure there are many here at Rice. Is there anyone here who is on the King Abdullah Scholarship Program? No, okay. Uh, is there one? Wonderful. Another one? Are you on CASP? I used, to have it. used to have it? That's wonderful. And I welcome you here. I, I think it's a great thing. I come from a public affairs background and I love that uh, students and educational exchanges can bring people. Uh, I think King Abdullah was incredibly forward looking, realizing that decades after he's long gone, the effect of those partnerships and information exchange will be felt in a very positive way. Um, so, these were, these were good things. These were, these were really good things. The, um, who here's from Louisiana? Anybody from, there's only a few of you? All right, so this brings me to another one of my stories. And I, I had one picture that I was gonna show, but I couldn't get it up on the PowerPoint presentation here. Uh, when we start talking about information exchange through student exchange and opportunities for US businesses, uh, I met about three months ago two people who'd studied in Lafayette, Louisiana. And if you're from there or if you've ever been there, you know they've got some excellent food. So in Khobar, there is a new restaurant called Creole that serves the best gumbo and etouffee this side of Riyadh. It is really, really good. And for me, it just shows that food tastes uh, are diversifying maybe at the same time as economic options are diversifying. This is the kind of thing that Saudi Arabia really wants to see. King Salman came on the scene after his half-brother King Abdullah died in 2015. And within a space of a few weeks, shook up the succession for the Saudi royal family in a way that hadn't been seen before. So for the first time, as Jim said, now you've got people in line after him who are from the grandsons of King Abdulaziz Saud. So the founders of the kingdom had his sons, up until now, including King Salman, they've been the ones ruling the country. The crown prince is Mohammed bin Naif, incredibly well respected for his role in the Ministry of Interior and in the counterterrorism work, especially of the last 12 years. And then Mohammed bin Salman, the deputy crown prince, who has uh, grown in respect, I think, for as people have come to see the way that he very ambitiously is trying to diversify the economy and change the way that Saudi Arabia itself operates, both socially and economically. The biggest way that he has been working on that is through Vision 2030. So if you've heard of Vision 2030, you may have heard of it talked about in different senses. What I wanna do is uh, maybe give you an overarching sense of what it is and how it came about. Vision 2030 very much is seen within Saudi Arabia, uh, I think accurately so, as being the project of Mohammed bin Salman, the Deputy Crown Prince. He's the head of the, commission, the Committee on uh, Economic and Development Affairs. 
He has ministries under that committee working with him that uh, include everything that would be tied into the economy. So the Ministry of Energy, Industry, and Minerals. You've got the uh, ministries uh, that deal with everything with electricity, water desalinization. You now have elements like the Royal Commission, which was an entity set up in the 1970s as a way to be kind of above ministries to facilitate industrial production. He has this whole body of the Saudi government working with him. In addition to that, he's also got a whole cadre of foreign advisors and consultants from several different uh, angles coming in and giving him advice, working with the individual ministries, helping them set up key performance indicators, KPIs, helping them get baseline data so that they can say, here's where we are now and here's where we're trying to go. When he launched this, it was preceded in the spring of 2016 by a whole media rollout. And this involved Mohammed bin Salman talking with international media. He's given a lot of uh, interviews to Bloomberg. When I drove around in April and May uh, around Saudi Arabia of, 20, of 2016, you saw billboards everywhere that Vision 2030 is coming. You see major parastatal companies like Aramco looking to see, can we say we are uh, tied in with Vision 2030 and supportive of it? So there's a, there's a media push on that side. The way that Mohammed bin Salman himself has explained it is, this is an effort to diversify the economy, get beyond simply oil and gas revenue, number one. And number two, it's a way to increase the number of private sector jobs. It looks at, I think, 450,000 jobs being created in the private sector in the next five years, for example. And number three, it looks to energize private sector investment in the economy. So you're talking about replacing a certain amount that uh, uh, they're looking to replace about 40% of the Saudi government's uh, spending on infrastructure with public sector spending over the coming years. So how is it going to be accomplished? There are four major pillars. They are the National Transformation Program, the Saudi Aramco uh, transformations, the use of the public investment fund, and international strategic partnerships. So let's talk about each of those. Sometimes the first one, which is the National Transformation Program, is the one that most gets thought of when people in Saudi Arabia are thinking of Vision 2030. The National Transformation Program is a roughly five-year program with some goals on timelines set for 2020 completion, so just in the next few years, that look specifically at energizing certain non-oil and gas sector energy, uh, industries. You've got mining, tourism, which is both things like Six Flags and uh, theme parks, as well as increased religious tourism, so increasing by many millions the number of pilgrims who come on Hajj and Umrah. To, uh, to Mecca and Medina. You've got um, the possibility that's being discussed in Saudi Arabia of movie theaters, and that's being studied. You've got other industries like healthcare that are being looked at, especially saving money in healthcare through greater digitization, using data to make the healthcare system more efficient. The, uh, the National Transformation Program has looked at education especially vocational and technical education, which itself has a very nice synchronicity with the job creation goals. Saudi Arabia's labor force needs to improve its vocational and technical skills, especially when you look at certain industries like uh, HVAC, AC technicians, if you look at plumbing and pipe fitting, electrical technicians, these are jobs that are typically right now filled by foreign laborers, highly skilled ones, but not by Saudis. If the Saudi economy can both create a training pipeline and then use Saudis in those jobs, it'll, uh, it'll quickly help to create Saudi jobs. So that's the National Transformation Program. It's been about one year since that was rolled out, and the talk has been that at some point there will be an assessment uh, using a dashboard system saying our KPIs that we set uh, said that we will reduce government subsidies by this much in this area and how are we doing at it? 
that'll be something entirely new, public accountability. If anybody has seen uh, the interview that Mohammed bin Salman just gave to the uh, Middle Eastern television station NBC just a few hours ago, he said, everyone will be accountable. I don't care if you're a prince, you're gonna be accountable for corruption. We are going to be accountable to the public about how the government is run. I think that'll be a major change and a different way that Saudi Arabia ad uh, addresses uh, public finance and public policy. Pillar number two is Saudi Aramco transformation. Now, some of this started under current Minister of Energy, Industry and Minerals, Khaled Al Fala, under the Aramco Modernization Program about 10 years ago, where he started to look beyond the core oil and gas sector. What the country of Saudi Arabia is looking at doing right now is going much further on two main things. One, you see it in the news, and this is the Aramco initial public offering, the IPO of Aramco. Mohammed bin Salman was just talking in this interview a few hours ago, and he said it's going to be around 5% of, uh, of, the of, uh, of the company. What will that include? Maybe some of you around here actually might know better than I do. I'm sure some of you will have some questions. Will it include upstream, meaning the oil and gas that's in the ground? Will it include downstream? Will it include the whole thing? I think from my friends at Aramco who I, who I talked to, they say the exact formula for what will be included is something that's still under study, but there is great commitment, regularly reinforced by the Deputy Crown Prince, that some of the company will go to an IPO. It'll be listed probably domestically in Saudi Arabia and overseas, but where is a question. And then that money will come back. And what will it be used for? Some of it will be used to create Saudi Aramco to, to transform it into an industrial conglomerate. And you already see the beginnings of this. This is where you look at a giant shipbuilding industry being built in the uh, small town of Ras al Khair, which is north of Jubail, which is north of Dahran on the, on the Gulf Coast in eastern Saudi Arabia. Some of it will go to the public investment fund. Now, that's where I want to talk about the PIF. This is pillar number three of Vision 2030. Saudi Arabia right now doesn't have a true sovereign wealth fund in the way that you might think of one that Kuwait or Norway has, but the idea is that if you raise some amount of capital, and numbers are out there in the media, you've seen them anywhere from maybe four or 500 million to two billion, uh, I'm sorry, four to 500 uh, billion to two trillion dollars. Let's add three zeros. So what do you do with that money? One of the first things uh, is you can invest it in the needed changes within Aramco to diversify into new sources of non-oil and gas revenue. Another thing that you can do is invest it in infrastructure around Saudi Arabia, roads and bridges and uh, maybe water and power production. And then another major part of it is you can use it to invest around the world in the way that any sovereign wealth fund does. And the idea is that the revenue from that IPO will kickstart the, uh, the investment fund. Which brings you very nicely to pillar number four of Vision 2030, which is international strategic partnerships. And the idea is that with key countries around the world, and the US very much is one of these, that there will be a, an office, a structure, a framework, and the resources to uh, enrich that relationship on every factor, diplomatic, political, social, economic, and to move all of those forward. So with those four together, they, uh, they, they were launched last spring. There is a website that you can go to. You can go and check out the, uh, the website of Vision 2030. They have the 80-page Vision 2030 plan in English or Arabic, whatever is easiest uh, for you to read. It dovetails with some really important things that major parastatals are doing. So if you work at Aramco, you've heard of ICTIFA. And, and I love it, Aramco people are so smart. They figured out an acronym that means something great in Arabic. So it means satisfaction. And at the same time, it stands for In Kingdom Total Value Added. And it's an Aramco initiative to double by 2021 to 70% the In Kingdom Value Added for Aramco's purchasing and procurement. Now, you remember how much of the economy is driven by the oil and gas sector. If Aramco makes a change and goes in a certain direction, it will be felt throughout the entire economy. 
It may be adjusted as it gets rolled out through the entire economy. I think Aramco uh, is such a good manager at many things that the kingdom can use it, learn lessons from it as something gets rolled out. But in any case, you know that this in-kingdom total value added, ICTFA initiative, from our perspective at the consulate and our mission in Saudi Arabia, this is one that we see happening only more in the coming years. And what it represents is an effort through a, a complicated quota uh, and um, uh, equation system that you can read about online to say what amount of value added in either services or labor or goods is being added in kingdom. It's, uh, it's a major way that I think Aramco is driving localization and Saudization uh, for, the, uh, for the economy. So that gets you up through the four major parts of Vision 2030. If you're sitting out there, who out here is a business person? We have, we have some, I'm glad to see. I hope you wanna make money. I think there's a lot of money to be made in Saudi Arabia, working with mutual interests that uh, can hit some of what Saudi Arabia is looking to do that can hit your profit margins that you're looking to achieve, and I believe hit some of our mutual interests in enriching our bilateral relationship. Things that are the same, things that had been important before for doing business in Saudi Arabia, they still will be important. Number one is having a presence of some kind on the ground. That's always been important. We get people coming out and saying, I've got an office in Dubai. As far as the Saudis are concerned, that does not count. You have to be in Saudi Arabia. Even having an office in Bahrain and driving over, oh, I don't know, are you really committed? If you have your office in Saudi Arabia, you really are committed. And that's seen as a commitment uh, to being in the kingdom. And it's worth something because you have the time to be able to drive around and get hit in the TGI Fridays parking lot and still at the end of the night go to a social gathering. If you have to get back to Bahrain, you'd have to be right back on the car and driving across. So being present is really important. The, the next thing is where are Americans and American companies being used right now? Take us back to 1944. We had a lot of folks from Texas and Louisiana with really colorful language teaching my Saudi friends and their fathers some, uh, some great Texas slang that uh, I don't think their mothers would have appreciated them saying, but nowadays we don't need oil patch guys out there working anymore. There are people from the US and many other countries that work on some rigs operated by international firms. There are also a lot of Saudis out there and they're coming up through a, uh, through a system, through a pipeline that feeds them in. But internationally, Americans are employed in Saudi Arabia working in highly skilled trades, engineering, entrepreneurship, and accounting. Areas where you're looking for high level intellectual skills and trustworthiness. And this is something that I think we can all thank our predecessors, maybe at the consulate, maybe our American uh, fellows who worked at Aramco for many decades, that they built up a well-deserved reputation that Americans are energetic, smart, and trustworthy. And I, I like to think that that is completely true. These are things that we can trade on. So if you're an American business person, I would start out from saying, how can I use that basis of understanding? Don't take it for granted, but especially make sure that you, uh, you continue to uphold it. The other thing to think about that has been true since the 70s is leading Saudis have history with the US. And whether that's history in terms of working with Americans who are working at Aramco, or whether it is history going to college in the US. I was out with a Saudi businessman today at a local oil and gas servicing firm where the firm wasn't quite sure. They were a little hesitant. Do they want to expand in a certain way in Saudi Arabia? The gentleman sitting next to me, he's probably in his late 50s, early 60s, and he's a Portland State grad. There are a whole level of Saudis who are leading Saudi companies, especially family business run companies right now, who went to college in the US and think very positively about it. So that's a great connection that you can trade off of. And that was there before Vision 2030. It was there and it still is there after Vision 2030. So. In terms of this talk today, I suppose one of the things that we should talk about is what is different under Vision 2030 for US companies? 
I think something you should be aware of, especially if you work in the oil and gas or energy sector, is the global trends and the global flows for energy. The energy um, that is produced in Saudi Arabia is increasingly being sent to customers in East Asia. So East Asian firms and companies and countries are looking for ways to lock in those production supply deals. And one of the best ways to do it is to be as responsive as I hope American companies are to say, well, Saudi Arabia wants to diversify and to create jobs. So could a country in East or Southeast Asia maybe help uh, and Engage the Saudis to encourage and ensure that it gets an oil supply by also supporting maybe some downstream petrochemical or other non-oil and gas production in Saudi Arabia? Absolutely. That could be a competitive factor that you're going to have to look at. So keep that in mind. The, uh, the next thing that's going to be a little bit different now is that the demand for local value added is changing. American firms for many years simply found a distributor in the US and they, I'm sorry, in Saudi Arabia. They would probably visit during OTC, just like I'm here during OTC this week. They'd find a distributor and that distributor would sell their things and import them back into Saudi Arabia. Under the ICTIFA guidelines and under the general pressure to meet Vision 2030 uh, goals, such importation won't work anymore. And it won't be enough to, uh, to guarantee that you get contracts. Aramco still looks at making decisions based on price and quality. But if all else is equal, the company that's got some local production is going to win the jobs. Now, what does that mean for a US company that's looking to keep jobs in the US? Well, some that I, were talking, that I was talking to this week, they're saying, here's what we're going to do. We're going to ensure by creating a factory in Saudi Arabia that we can meet Saudi localization guidelines, but at the same time, that initial door that we open is going to open up a whole range of exports in training services, certification services. Companies do a lot that they can charge for looking at using their products safely and correctly. And then secondly, it's going to open up access to what are we best at? The innovative new solutions. So I'm making this up, but say you sell drill bits. Well, maybe your basic drill bit that you're making today can be produced in Saudi Arabia. That gets you in the door. It ensures that your drill bit redesign factory that's back here, that's creating the next generation, is guaranteed some business. The, the next thing that I think is very important is that you remember renewables are going to be a part of the Saudi energy equation. We talk a lot about oil and gas, and you, you see figures about the amount of oil that Saudi Arabia has, about their imperative to find and produce gas, especially for power production and desalinization of water. But Saudi Arabia has set the goal of installing about 9.5 gigawatts of renewable energy between wind and solar within the next 10 years. This is seen as a new area. It's an area that they want to not only create electricity this way, but also produce the components, windmills and photovoltaic cells and others right there in Saudi Arabia. So there might be some new opportunities for you. You should recognize that there are Saudi partners looking to make the ecosystem work well for American firms. And some of these are very helpful to you. So you've got the Royal Commission, which I've mentioned. This is a platform that looks to ease the, uh, the bureaucracy and the registration process. You've got a new facility in eastern Saudi Arabia called Dahran Techno Valley that is patterned a bit on Silicon Valley to take the output of the King Fahad University for Petroleum and Minerals and the proximity to Aramco, bring in foreign companies. Right now about two-thirds of the companies are from the U.S. And then in that ecosystem create new systems, new solutions for problems in the oil and gas sector in Saudi Arabia. This has been a way that several American firms have been able to guarantee that they get business by listening to what the Saudis want. They want more training and research and development locally. They want jobs for their researchers. This is a good way to do it. And at the same time, if you're there on the ground helping them meet that need, you're going to be more well-placed to meet the needs to sell your products. Another thing to look at 
is us from the US consulate. So that building that we built in the late 40s, uh, that the Italians built for us in the late 40s, it's a wonderful building. And it's got a lot of charm and character. It doesn't have a lot of space and it doesn't have very good air conditioning. We're building a brand new one. We just broke ground on it in March. It's a $200 million plus facility that's a commitment of the US to Eastern Saudi Arabia to this partnership with the home of oil and gas and it represents an expansion of what we can do to help. If you're a business person and you're looking for advice on specific companies, if you're looking for advice on sectors to get into, our facility can be there to help. I can give out my card later. You can reach us through the web. Um, the lessons learned that are very important. Saudi Arabia, and Saudi partners, they often expect that foreign entities coming in have incredibly deep pockets and deep benches of, uh, of human resources. You look at some of the biggest joint ventures going on. You've got a $20 billion joint venture in Sadara, which is a joint venture between Aramco and Dow with the biggest US export import bank loan in that bank's history. Started out close to five billion, ended up being about $4.35 billion of US government financing to ensure that more than 400 US companies could sell their products to build the single biggest petrochemical facility built at one time in the world. That represents more than most of your companies here today would ever be able to bring to the table. So on the one hand, this is the type of experience that Saudi Arabia is used to. They say, we wanna go big, we're gonna create this, bring everything that you've got. On the other hand, Saudi Arabia and the US, we wanna get more small and medium-sized enterprises into the mix. And that can be difficult because an SME doesn't necessarily have the expertise, the depth, uh, or frankly, the comfort level from its board or its leadership to say, yeah, I'm gonna jump in out there and invest this much. So what can you do to square that circle? One of the best ways, I think, is to look at the ecosystem of suppliers and the supply chain of the big guys that are going into Saudi Arabia. If you wanted to come up and get in touch with us later, tell me the industry that you're working in and say, look, I'm a small company, I do pipes, I do valves. I can't go as big as you're saying, Mike. Well, we'd say, who are you selling them to? You're selling them to a major oil and gas servicing company? Well, that oil and gas servicing company has its own imperative to meet localization guidelines. Why don't we see if we can match you up and Aramco and others will probably be able to help you with this to bring you in under their wing. It gets you on the ground, make sure that your product is sold rather than your competitors from some other place in the world. And at the same time, it helps that other company that's trying to guarantee their business. Something that's come up in the last 18 months, especially as Saudi Arabia uh, started running a budget deficit, was questions about our contractors getting paid. And uh, I recognize that this is a concern for some. I recognize that there were some American contractors that had questions, are we gonna be able to get paid? What we've seen is that especially since some Ministry of Finance decisions that were made in late 2016, so about six months ago now, Contracts have been paid. There had been a delay before, but the Saudi government recognizes that's not good for business. It's not good for the whole health of the economy and they need to address it. I've seen them making good faith efforts to do so, but that delay does exist. So keep that in mind. And that's something that we can help with if there's a specific problem. It can be very hard to get qualified expatriate staff in, uh, especially if they're women. And this is something that I've heard from uh, American firms that work in that Dahran Techno Valley, for example. They, they want to bring in uh, an unmarried American female PhD material scientist, and there's not necessarily a way right now to, uh, to say, all right, here's the visa class that this person is going to bring in. That's a reality. So Saudi society might be changing, but it isn't necessarily at the point where something like that is, uh, is as routine as it might be in other countries. Another thing to think about is that as the kingdom looks to increase non-oil and gas sector revenues and keep more of the salaries paid to staff in the country rather than going home as remittances, there are some fees that are coming in. And these include uh, some fees on visas and residence permits. If you're just an American visitor coming and going, 
You're governed by a reciprocity, reciprocity agreement between the US and Saudi governments. So your regular visitor visa will still be the same amount. You'll cost about $150 for a five-year multiple entry visa. But if you're gonna be working in Saudi Arabia, then you're gonna get hit with some newer charges that will make it more costly. Now, that might come to a few thousand dollars a year. It's not necessarily prohibitive, but across many staff in your, in your country, in your company, it might, uh, it might hit that level. The, the Saudi government is working very hard to streamline its processes. The Saudi Arabian General Investment Authority, SAGIA, uh, has made some announcements in late 2015 when King Salman visited the US, they announced that now foreign firms could wholly own subsidiaries in Saudi Arabia for the first time. As of now, I think they're up to four that have been approved to do so with another 10 or so uh, on the way. These are probably big companies, giant blue chip stock companies that are doing this. Uh, my point in telling you this is that there is a move in that direction. It helps some companies that want to be able to keep their, their profits in-house, but it's something that's just beginning right now. Some of the best companies that we've seen, and there's one that I'll name because the State Department gave GE our award for corporate excellence back in January. They are not alone in some of what they've done, but they are doing it very well in terms of listening to what the Saudis are trying to do, and in a very ethical and uh, filled with integrity approach, they're saying, all right, well, we see where you wanna go with Vision 2030. We see what you're trying to do with empowering women and hiring women into jobs. So we're gonna set up a giant all-female call center. We're going to help you with digitization of the healthcare system. We're going to bring in some of our major factories to produce here. And the Saudis love it. And I'll tell you what we love about it from the US government side is that they have done it in a way that just like that first consulate in 1944 was opened 10 years after US companies started coming in for the oil and gas industry, it shows commercial leadership. And I think that's important. It brings me to, I think, my, my final two stories I'd like to close with before we talk about uh, questions that you might have. Remember that what I said with Saudis looking at Americans for innovation, real excellence in engineering and trustworthiness, that innovation is something that I think we rightfully are known for. And as you look at whether it's GE or other companies, I think that you should lead with it if you're looking for a US business opportunity in Saudi Arabia. In the last year, we looked across our consulate and we said, what are people asking us about? And we realized there was a whole collection of organizations, young people's organizations, Saudi Aramco itself, foreign companies that were all interested in innovation and entrepreneurship. What was interesting was they weren't necessarily talking to each other. And this is something that we do a lot in the US government overseas. We help convene people and bring them together just to have a conversation. That's usually a great value that we can add. What I saw was that one US-based oil and gas servicing company outdid us. They said the same thing that we did. They recognized that all these different uh, organizations and entities had a shared goal, but they weren't talking to each other. So they jumped in and they made an investment and they said, we're going to help you talk to each other about innovation. And they set up a speaker series. They used their small facility. They invited people in. And I'm convinced that because they did that, they became recognized by firms that were doing hiring and purchasing in Saudi Arabia as a firm that is helpful, committed to Saudi goals, and on the same page that they could trust that they could sell their products. So I encourage you to use what's best in American ingenuity and innovation. And if you're working in Saudi Arabia, lead with it. Use it as a way to get out there. Do what we do and help convene Saudis. Bring in American experts because it's gonna come back to you in terms of business and profitability. The, the, the final story that I wanted to, to leave you with, it's, uh, it, it's about the amount of interest that we've seen in the last year in training and education. I've talked some about the synchronicity and goals of 
uh, training Saudis. You might first say, wait a second, we're training them, they're gonna take our jobs. What you're gonna do is create more jobs and you're gonna create a cohort of Saudis who understand the value of American products and American ingenuity and innovation. We heard about this demand for training last year and we put our team together and we said, all right, we're gonna bring in some American educational institutions, Votech institutions, some companies that are doing training and certification. If we can get five to come who are interested and they've got some leads in Saudi Arabia, this will be a success. We ended up with 43 that wanted to come and we had to cap it because these 43 US institutions coming into Saudi Arabia had all been in touch already with Saudi potential partners and they knew that they were gonna have deals to do. When those 43 came in, they did sign deals. They've done some follow-up even in the, in the next three months since then. And now, as Saudi Aramco and others look to set up new joint ventures in training, so there's a new drilling institute that's being set up. There's a maritime institute. There's an energy institute. I'm very proud that there's going to be American firms that are in the running and I hope can win some of the contracts to train a whole generation of Saudis. So if this is anything that you work in, I encourage you, get in touch with us, my colleagues, we can help you get over there because there is a thirst for the information and if you can be the ones providing it, you will be helping build that strategic partnership between Saudi Arabia and the United States. Thank you very much.